Then looking at verses 43 through 48. 43 through 48. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. For you may be sons of your, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you even, uh, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here he's trying to, to help us understand the, the, uh, the, the rabbis and the corruption of the rabbis of that day. Uh, took Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. If you want to look at that verse right quick. Uh, it was, it was, somebody look that one up for me, right? 19, what? Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. They took that statement and added to it about and hate your enemy. That was not what the law said. The law did not have anything about the enemy in it. But the, the religious leaders of that day, or in days gone by, from the day in which Jesus had become a part of the law, uh, had put into it, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was the part that had been added concerning hating your enemy. And uh, that was not what Jesus had said. Uh, he, his, his expectation... Uh, had us loving one another, expressing love uh, in tangible ways for others. And Jesus uh, wants us as his disciples to remember uh, that, that we, you know, he loved us before we ever knew how to love. Christ loved us. And he taught us to love our neighbors. <clears throat> and, uh, and the Jewish leaders added a statement about hating the enemies that he never had there. And, and uh, the disciples, were going, of course, taking a, a long look at, at their hearts, the place in which righteousness is affirmed and is a place where it's cultivated, needed to see that that was never what he intended uh, to say. <coughs> Even they had tampered with the scriptures uh, by... Uh, defining their neighbors to include only the Jews and anybody that wasn't a neighbor, a Jew, they could hate. In fact, the Gentiles did that. I mean, the Jews did that to the point that they would go around Samaria. They wouldn't even go through Samaria on the road, even if they didn't talk to anybody. They wouldn't even go through Samaria. They hated their, those people so much. And, uh, and Gentiles were almost as bad as that. If you were... In fact, if you were a Jew, anybody that wasn't a Jew was a Gentile. And uh, Samaritans, of course, were those that lived in the country of Samaria that separated Jewish territory of Judea from Galilee. And uh, they would go through, they would not go through the, the place of Samaria. They would go many miles around. And when you're going by foot, that's meaning you hate somebody pretty badly. If you're, if you're going to go out of your way to, to avoid them and stay away from them. And, uh, and Jesus is trying to help them see uh, that, that uh, kingdom citizens, God's followers, his disciples, need to practice self-denying, self-giving, non-discriminating love toward everyone, even the enemies, for God does the same. If he hadn't loved us even while we were yet sinners, we could put that as the word enemies, we wouldn't have an opportunity of salvation. <coughs> He expressed love for us even when we were enemies of His uh, in order that we could be saved. <clears throat> so, uh, in simple but thought-provoking manner, Jesus gave us two reasons for loving our enemies and exhibiting it by praying for our persecutors. First, 
We want to resemble our Father in heaven. He graces evil people as well as good people. That's what he means by sending the, the sunshine and the rain on the just as well as the unjust. Uh, he blesses us all uh, with the rain, with the sunshine. In other words, he, he doesn't discriminate against the good versus the bad. <coughs> And second, we don't want to love so that we will be loved. And we will want to be loved so that we'll be loved. He said, if you don't love, I'm not going to love you. <laughs> In other words, uh, we don't want to love so that we'll be loved. By mentioning tax collectors and Gentiles, he's saying that these two groups of people that knew nothing about love, that most of the people hated, the Jewish people hated, if they loved, they expected to be loved in return. And he said, uh, don't be like them. Don't be like the tax collectors who, uh, as he put it here, uh, do not be, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? The tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, means only the Jewish people, what have you done extra? Not even the tax collect. I mean, even the tax collectors do that. And and he's saying you haven't done anything extra. You haven't shown the the Christian spirit toward people. If all you do is love those that, that will love you in return, and do good for those who will do good for you in return, you haven't done anything out of the way. Let me mention something here. Steve Kelly, our uh, associational mission strategist came in a little over a year ago now, uh, new to the area, he was from Morgan City, and he said, you know, he and his wife began to visit churches. And he said, uh, in many churches they went to, uh, that unless it, the, the preacher who would know him and all would greet him, he said they wouldn't even be greeted by anybody else in the church. And he said, then they began to notice that uh, if they are greeted, it's only by people who are probably 40 years of age and over, and more likely women than men. He said, that, that takes away from the, I mean, that doesn't count the guys who are standing there giving you a bulletin when you go in. He said, they're, they're there to give you a bulletin and say, welcome. But he said, other than that, and he said, you know, we, we, take a bath and we dress nicely and go in and sit down in the church. I've got a Bible with me so that they know that, you know, even if they don't know who I am, they, they should think that we're pretty nice folks. And he said, but he, he said, even just before Christmas, they went to a church. It was in West Monroe. I'll let you off the hook on that one. There was a church over there and he said, we, we were sitting a little, you know, closer to the front than to the, a little closer than midway. And he said, we sat there thinking, all right, let's see. And he said, people were milling about, going past us and everything. And he said, finally, just before service, one person came by and welcomed him and said, thank you for, for being here today. He said, he looked at her and he said, that's one. He said, nobody else. What do we do for people who are new coming in? We've had guests in our services uh, the last several weeks, several guests coming. Do we, we greet them besides just giving them a bulletin when they come in the door? Do we make them feel welcomed? You know, we want to say that we're a welcoming church and a friendly church, and I pray that we are. But when Steve began to say and share the experiences they're having and going from church to church, and he said, no young people. He said, it's amazing. He said, so that when this generation of young people gets older, <clears throat> what's it going to be like in the churches then? If they're not greeting people now, what will they do when they get to be the adults? Will they greet people then? Will they even say, welcome, come on in? So just something to think about and, and think about loving those who love you in return, those that... But he said, you know, we're, we look like most of the folks that are in the church, you'd think. Uh, they, they would at least say welcome. I hope we welcome people and, uh, and, and make them feel welcome. And uh, then he gives us the last verse there in chapter 5. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. 
That translates two Greek words. This word, you should be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Those two words, perfect, in the English language, translates two Greek words that express a command and denote uh, an end goal or an outcome. It's a command, but also the desire of, a, of an outcome that he's talking about. The idea of gaining maturity is uh, does not fully interpret the quotation from Leviticus on this. Uh, perfection is attainable only when all evil is vanquished, and we know that for the Christian that will only happen when we reach heaven. So we know we're not going to attain perfection here on this earth. Uh, we need to exhibit maturity. Just be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We will reach that point when we get to heaven. But the desire of our life day by day should be to be more like Him every day. Again, just the, the fact that we know we're not going to become perfect here does not or should not keep us from striving to be more perfect every day, to be more like Him each day. You know, some people say, well, I can never attain that, so give up on the idea. That's not what he's wanting. He's, he, he's telling us what we should do and what the desired outcome is. The, the goal is be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The desired outcome is to be like Jesus. That'll happen when we get to heaven. But the goal of our life in maturing as believers should be to be more like him day by day. Gaining in that uh, growth of being perfect. Again, realizing you're not going to make it here. But I hope we're a lot further along today than we were five years ago as a believer. Or even a year ago. Or even a month ago. We should be growing in our relationship with Him. And so Matthew magnifies the fact that the Righteousness demanded of the kingdom citizens cannot be attained on the basis of merit. It's given through mercy. And, uh, and, and that one statement in verse 48 really summarizes verses 17 through uh, 47. That statement of be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, is a summary of all that he has said concerning our righteousness exceeding the righteousness of of the scribes and the Pharisees. Or you're not going to make it to heaven. Their goal, in fact, they're going to be more like those who uh, Jesus said, will say, but Lord, didn't we do many wonderful things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you can, I, I start to tell you about a dream I had last night, but I won't. It, it, was, it was the rapture. And, and and I literally heard it like loud wind, and it was unusual. Anyway, I won't go into all of it. It, it was interesting. Though. I looked over to see if Luke was still there. <laughs> <laughs> this all was taking place. I thought we might be fixing to go together. I want to make sure. Wait, what if she were gone? And you well, then that would have been a problem. <laughs> I, I'm just. I did. I, I literally looked over to make sure we were off to the same place. It, it was very vivid. Huh? It's very easy. You know, she had to go into the bathroom or something right about the time. And you looked over there. And I believe you died of I was like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on? Bible does talk about those who, who, who think everything's okay. And, and we need to be careful, even as we talked about this morning, where, do we really love Jesus? Well, what's our motivation for what we're doing? Is it out of a heart of love for the Lord Jesus? Or are we simply doing it because we're going through the motions of things that we've been taught to do? Uh, and, and again, this summary of all, you've heard that it was said, do this, but I say to you, do this. All of these statements he's making are helping us to see where our heart is our heart for the Lord. Are we are, out of the heart 
comes all of these thoughts and these actions of life. It all starts there. And He's wanting us to be perfect even as our Father in Heaven is perfect. And that's the goal. Well, He continues to teach us how He expects us to grow in disciple, as His disciples as we move into chapter 6. And he's been helping us so that we can learn to nourish a relationship with Him that's characterized by true happiness. Blessed are those and, and that's the word for happiness. And he showed that, you know, authentic righteousness begins in the heart. And, uh, and we need to move for there. What, what are the spiritual disciplines then that are needed in our life? Uh, that's where he's going with these next three examples of spiritual disciplines uh, for our life. He gave three areas in the practice of righteousness wherein the Pharisees by overt display perverted worship and turned it into an effort to gain public <coughs> approval. Three areas we're going to look at are almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. And in verses 1 through 4, it's the area of our giving. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, again, you're not, not talking about their tithes and all, you're talking about their charitable, their almsgiving, the, the charitable deeds that they were doing. When you do this, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. And the streets are where they're giving it to those who are on the side of the, the, the streets begging for money. Uh, because that was the only way they had of making money. So he's saying both in the temple as well as in the streets what you're doing. Uh, let me go back where I was. Hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, it's all about almsgiving, but it could be any of our giving that's, that's back to the Lord. Uh, it could be even your tithes and offerings, that which you're bringing to the Lord's house to give back. What is that that he's teaching? What's the life principle that he's sharing here that's an imperative for us? It's much more than a simple instruction. He's giving them a stern command about how they should do these things, these three areas that we're going to be talking about. Uh, he expects us to take responsibility for being careful to keep a firm grip on our motive. Uh, again, he, these are three areas of righteousness. What is your motive for being righteous or doing the right thing? That's what the word basically means. Uh, Jesus brought up the issue of reward earlier in his instruction. Now he's returning to it uh, with a central issue uh, of talking about our public life. How do we live for him in the public eye? And the first example involves the spiritual discipline of giving. He knew that they would give to the poor. That was part of, of what they did on a regular basis. The sounding of trumpet. Uh, there were those who, who would make a loud a, a noise out on the streets to call attention to the fact that they were stopping to help uh, somebody. Uh, in, I, I was reading something that I'd never read before, that these urns that were in the temple had a, a, a funnel type thing in that that was kind of like, uh, shaped like a trumpet that when they would put in their, their coin, their money, it would, in going down through that tunnel, it would make a loud noise and, and they made a big to-do out of putting it in there in the fashion that everybody could hear it. I'd never heard of the funnel type thing. I knew that they were uh, metal structures, these containers that were in the temple, and I'd always... What I'd always studied in the past was the fact that uh, when they put these larger amounts of money in there, 
uh, it would make a loud clanging noise that would draw attention to it. The whole thing that he's talking about here is the drawing attention to yourself for what you're doing. What is the motivation for why you are seeking to do that which is right? Is it to gain attention for yourself or is it for truly uh, your service to the Lord? Uh, you're, you're, what you're doing, is it, is it to be a blessing to others even as he's blessed you? Even a blessing back to the Lord and thanksgiving for what he's done for you? Or is it simply to draw attention to yourself for that which you're doing? And he said that the Pharisees of that day were self-righteous hypocrites is what he called them. Making a lot of noise as they dropped their money into the uh, coffers in the, the temple and also drawing a lot of attention to themselves as they helped the people out on the streets. Now the word hypocrite comes from that day uh, of, of a play actor on a stage who played more than one part. Uh, they had these little uh, faces that they would hold up in front of their face to play the part of somebody in, in acting. And the word hypocrite meant pretending to be somebody you were not. That's, I saw a preacher one time, uh, it was in a meeting of some kind, and he was preaching about hypocrites, and he reached up, jerked his tie, and jerked it off. He said, just like this tie, it's a hypocrite. It's one of those clip-on ties. He said, it's pretending to be a tie. And I didn't tie it at all. It's a clip-on. Oh, uh, well, I guess that's one definition you can give it. Pretending to be something you're not. But it sure shocked everybody, you know, and he just reached over and grabbed it and jerked it off. I can still see it. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, that, the word hypocrite originally meant something good uh, coming out of the, the plays of that day. We've come to look at it in a, in a negative light because pretending to be something you're not, is, and that's what Jesus was using it in a negative way here, to say that these people are pretending to do good when all they're really trying to do is draw attention to themselves and what they're doing. And uh, maturing disciples of Jesus reflect a different motive in their giving is what he's trying to say. We only care about pleasing the Lord with what we give. Uh, in fact, he said you're going to take extra precaution to make sure you do it in secret. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to hide it, uh, but it, it means that you're not doing it in open display for the world to know to draw attention to yourself. Which brings up the question about, uh, and, and, and it was mentioned in some of the material I've said, that people sometimes say, that uh, I don't want any record of my giving to be kept or given back to me at the end of the year. By the way, we forgot to pass them out. She had them this morning. Oh, she did? Pass them out? Okay. Yeah. Marianne got your record of contributions ready. There's nothing wrong with that. You, you, you don't get that in order to, to nail it to a poster board somewhere and for everybody to come by to look at it. Uh, some of you will use it possibly with your income tax preparation to to uh, get a, uh, you know, use out of it that way. That may be the only thing. Or maybe just for you to, to be able to see what you've done over the course of the year with regard to your tithes and offerings given uh, through your church. It's not done for the purpose of public display. Uh, I, I, and I can't remember the preacher's name right now, but it happened up in uh, Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. There was some big controversy about uh, first Baptist Nashville. Well, first, yeah, First Baptist Nashville, about people saying that those who were influential in the church uh, were the ones who were giving the most money. And the preacher got the records of everybody's giving, put them out on the altar. He said, I want you to know this afternoon you can come by and look at anybody's giving record, and you can see what's what. <laughs> I thought, boy, that's pretty bold to, to do that. But they, he was wanting to solve a problem they were having. And I understand it solved the issue. But uh, in his mind, it was not that way. But there were those who were saying that the big givers were the ones who were having the greatest influence. And he was saying that's not true. If you want to see, the, the loudest complainers are the ones who are giving the least. And that was what was happening. And, uh, and he wanted people to be able to see. Come look. It's going to be out here on display. And... Uh, 
Again, that's not usually done. <laughs> uh, only one time have I ever known of that to happen. I don't know if he stayed there or not. But uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's not for public display. It is, it, when he says do it in secret, he's just meaning you're not doing it for the purpose of man. You're doing it out of obedience to the Lord and a, and a heart for the Lord in, in, in your giving. And that's the reason you're doing that. Our time is up. We're going to pick up with praying in our, uh, the model prayer is what we'll be looking at as a part of that. And also we'll be looking at the, uh, what was the next area? The, about, yeah. Fasting. Let me look back at the scriptures here. Fasting and possessions. The area of prayer and fasting, right. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting are the three examples, the three areas that he gives. Uh, we'll continue with it next week. And then also, that's the first Sunday of February. We'll let you know next Sunday where we're going from there. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you again for the privilege of being able to share in the study of your word. And I thank you for these and their willingness to come. And I trust that you'll give us a good week. Father, help us to be mindful of the opportunities about us to share a word for you and to truly be Christ-like in our relations with others. May we never be able to pass up that opportunity to just let others know what you mean to us. It goes out of our comfort zone, but it's that which truly will bring honor and glory to you. And it'll help us to feel even better about what we're doing as children of yours, to know that we have shared with somebody else. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just quickly tell you, I shared with the prayer meeting group Wednesday night, 95% of the people say that they've never shared their faith with anybody else. 95% of those who claim to be Christians say they've never shared their faith. It is out of your comfort zone. When you asked that girl for the first date, that was out of your comfort zone, but you did it. You're glad you did. You'll be glad you did that as well. There was a, at the evangelism conference this week, there was a statement made that I'd never heard before that Adrian Rogers was sharing about a deacon in his church who was on his deathbed. He went to visit him. And that deacon told him, he said, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm ashamed to die. He said, what do you mean you're ashamed to die? He said, I have never shared with anybody my faith in the Lord. I've never asked anybody about coming to Christ as their Savior. I hope you will not get to the end of life and say, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm ashamed to die. When you stand before the Lord to give an accounting of your life, he asked you, how many, what did you lay up in heaven? You know, he said, lay up treasures in heaven. Did you know that the currency of heaven are the souls of people? I hope that you've shared that. Now, I know we don't, we're not the ones who win them. Only Jesus wins them. But we are responsible for sharing what he means to us with somebody else. And I hope you'll do that uh, even this week. Let, he'll open the doors. He'll give you an opportunity. We talk about the weather all the time because that's become comfortable for us. Why not talk to somebody about Jesus and just say, you know, he's good. He, he's blessed me. He's helped me. Let me you know him as your Savior. Just tell him what he means to you. With that thought, see you Wednesday night and next Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, in two or three more months. I will, will right? Uh, yeah, just got to drop it in there. Right. Not all right. 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 I'll make sure. Take, uh, I didn't get that. And he said, well, I have a job. You were going to go to the restaurant. I did not see a number of the house. I had my 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 house. It's a truck his aunt that lives in the car. I would have bought it from him. And he said, and I paid to have it fixed, and it broke again in two months. And I didn't have the money. And this, these people are shifting. Are related to his grandma. And they told him that they would, he, they would come to Texas, live on their ranch, is what they call it. And they pay them to work, and they can live there, and they pay them. No, these are the people in Texas. Uh, this, this couple. Well. I had a man tell me one day that he said, Hey, it's like that man up there. But he's up on Foresight. And he asked me, he said, uh, Can you give me $5 to get to Atlanta? Uh, I said, first of all, it's going to cost you more money to get to Atlanta than $5. Yeah. Well, they can't pay you to work. Yep. Saying that they would pay him and all. And uh, they're real. I don't know if they have to use the word religious or not. He said, you know, Miss Beth, Daddy and I, we're used to Baptists. We, we go to Baptist churches. He said, I don't know what they are. And I said, well, now, Devin, I noticed on their website they use, use the word Jehovah and Yeshua. I said, that's close to Jewish. And he said, well, oh, I thought I hit it. Uh, 